There it goes. Perfect. Before I, I get too deep into the, the topic, I'd like to give you a disclaimer that uh, my presentation is going to have some, some science, some referenced information, but it's also going to have a lot of information that is my opinion. And having had the opportunity to serve on two expert panels for the World Health Organization, some of the opinions of some of the the experts in the world on, on Campy. If we look backward in time, what we understand about Campy is really very small compared to what we understand about Salmonella. And in fact, in the if we would be having this discussion in the 60s, we'd be calling it Vibrio Jejuni, not Campy Jejuni. It's changed names, in fact, since the last 40 years. So a lot of what we understand about Campy is what we're learning today. And we'll be learning a lot more in the future. Why we're even bothering to talk about it is, so far as CDC is concerned, Campy is one of the major uh, bacterial foodborne uh, diseases in humans. And because of that, and the fact that poultry is the number one meat that's eaten in the United States, we're talking about campy and campy foodborne illness. So Roy Burgess, Randy Singer, Steve Thayer, and I had a, a uh, USDA grant. And I, oh, I'm i gonna try to bring some of this information from this USDA grant where we were studying Salmonella and Campy on broiler farms all the way through and into the processing plant to carcass rinses post chill. And trying to bring all of that information together and help you to understand the difference between Salmonella and Campy. Because there are two very distinct organisms and behave very differently within chickens. If we look at, at this study, we followed 55 flocks, broiler flocks, we made sure they were the first flocks that came into the processing plant each day so that we didn't have to worry about any cross-contamination from previous flocks in, those plant, in that plant. And so all of the data I'll show you are, are should be true to what was on that farm and brought into the plant and run through that plant. So if we look at salmonella, and the prevalence that we found on the farm, and I'll show you the samples we took, 91% of the samples were positive for salmonella with 64% positive for campy. When we come to the plant, that level of salmonella on the farm predicted pretty well the level of salmon or salmonella in the plant. But with campy, it, it appeared that that what we saw on the farm was lower than what actually ended up coming into the plant. So those farm samples, we were trying to understand which samples would be the best ones to take for Salmonella and Campy. So boot socks were the typical boot sock that you're used to taking, walking through the house and putting those in the bag and that's the sample. Drag swabs were the, the original salmonella uh, detection method. And, and since then, we've found that boot socks work better. And you can see why. 68% prevalent for salmonella on a boot sock with 43% on the drag swab. Fecal samples were fresh feces that we stood in five different areas and picked a handful of, of fecal samples and they moved to another area and picked another handful compositive. So they're fresh, fresh fecal samples. And the litter samples were similar to the fecal samples of composite. For salmonella, 68% for the boot socks, 43 drag swab and so on. For campy, it almost appeared as if it didn't matter what sample we took, where we were going to find it. 
whether it was a boot sock, a drag swab, or a fecal sample. And in studies that I've done since then, that it's still the same. But since we're looking, we want to look for Salmonella and Campy, we, we use a boot sock, and that makes finding both Salmonella and Campy easier. Well, why does it not matter which sample we use for Campy? Let's look at Salmonella first, though. This is the number of, of Salmonella. Um, the mean is that dark bar in the center of the box plot and in the range. And we can see that on a boot sock, roughly 10 to the 2 um, Salmonella per boot sock was the average. Look at the difference with Campy. The Campy on that same boot sock was over five logs. So three, three logs higher Campy. And I think that's why it doesn't matter which sample type. You could see drag swabs about the same five logs with fecal samples slightly higher. Campy is on the farm at much higher numbers than we see with salmonella. And so the sample type today probably is not as critical as it is with salmonella. So what happens when we move into the processing plant arena? If we look at, and what we took in this sample was 12 birds with feathers on, uh, rinse, and that's the outside. We took six from that same plant at hot rehang, six birds post ev uh, evisceration, but pre-chill, and then six birds post-chill from each flock. Outside of the plant then, those feathers on rinses found that 46% were positive for salmonella with 68% positive for campy. If we just track the salmonella through the processing plant, we can see that yes, hot rehang is still higher, but the plant's interventions are beginning to work. The pre-chill are lower, the post-chill is lower. Whereas if we look at campy, we're starting out at 68% prevalence to 63% to still almost 60% at pre-chill, and then it drops down to 43% post-chill. So our interventions aren't reducing or eliminating the campy to the same extent as they do in the uh, with salmonella. And I think this is the reason why it's numbers. For salmonella, the mean on those feathers on rinches is, is around one log with a few outlier um, rinches that are up as high as almost five logs. And then as the, those broilers move through that processing plant to the post-chill rinse, we can see the numbers get down to nearly zero. That plant's working well. But if we look at Campy, we're starting out at a mean of almost five logs. And we begin to drop, our interventions are dropping it, but we've dropped from five logs to four logs to three logs and all the way down to one log. So we're beginning to lower it with our interventions, but not nearly as effect effectively with Campy as we see with Salmonella. And even so, at post chill, we still have some carcasses that have almost seven logs of campy. So campy coming into the plant is much higher in numbers, and it's much more difficult to lower it through the plant. If we look at within the flock prevalence of campy, this number helps us to better understand why the difference between salmonella and campy um, in control is difficult. Each of these dots is represents the 12 um, feathers on rinses. So at the top of the salmonella, we have four 
clocks that had all 12 of those rinses positive for salmonella. So they were 100% positive. At the bottom with salmonella, we have six that were 100% negative and a nice even distribution. With Campy, it appears that they're either, if one bird is positive, they're all positive. And at the bottom, if one bird is negative, they're all negative. There's not much in between. So flocks are either positive or they're negative. And that I think is where it's more difficult for us to understand campy and what goes on in campy in a, in a processing plant and what comes into the processing plant it, because it's at so much higher um, prevalence than salmonella. So Campy jejuni is the primary Campy that is isolated from people that have human foodborne illness. And it is the Campy jejuni that is the primary Campy that we isolate isolated in this study of the 1200 different camp campy isolates 80 percent were either campy jejuni or another eight percent were campy jejuni and campy coli campy coli was the second most common for us and that is also for the human foodborne illness the second most common so 88 percent of the campies we isolated were campy jejuni One of the, the unknowns, and this is true throughout the world for, for Campy, is why do broiler flocks not, why can't we detect Campy at day of age in broiler flocks? Whereas normally with, with salmonella, if we look for salmonella, it's going to be on a broiler farm and it's going to be there um, at the beginning. With Campy, we oftentimes can't detect it until they're seven to 14 days of age. When they do go positive, then they're, they're all positive. And why that happens, we don't understand. And none of the experts in the world have yet sorted out that reason for Campy almost disappearing and then all of a sudden showing up. If we wanted to measure and Last week, I was asked to, uh, to present by the National Chicken Council and Turkey Federation to FSIS some work that we had done. And we know that we want to understand campy loads on the farm and as it comes into the processing plant, what is our best sample type? And I showed you the boot sock data. How does that correlate to what we see with those? amount of campy coming into the plant on those feathers on rinses that we can see that there's a very good correlation extremely good correlation between the number of campy on a boot sock and these boot socks were taken one week before processing and the number of campy that are coming in on these feathers on rinses so collecting boot socks prior to the broilers coming to the plant can give us somewhat of a, a good indicator of the load of campy coming into those processing plants by into the processing plant by those same broilers. Now, when we began that study, one of the things we wanted to understand was what timing for our sample on the farm. And we looked at three weeks, two weeks, and one week prior to those broilers coming to the processing plant with those boot sock samples. And what we found was that the strongest correlation, like you're seeing here in this graph, is when it's one week prior to processing. Two weeks is the second best, and three weeks, it's very hard to make a correlation of the amount of salmonella or campy on that farm to what's gonna come into the processing plant. So the, the earlier or the, 
the best sample to take or sample timing to take is the closest to processing you can get with your boot saw to predict what the load will be coming into the plant. Now, why flies? We know that flies can be a source for salmonella. We also know that they can be a source for transmission of campy. And the reason I've put flies first here when we want to consider what can we do on the farm is in Europe, they have a very strong correlation between house flies and house flies getting into broiler farms and, and campy um, appearing on those broiler farms. And so they've, they actually, um, some countries require fly screens on the air inlets to prevent flies from coming into these broiler houses. For us in the United States, I don't think flies are as critical. And I'll show you some research data that, that um, helps me understand why flies aren't as critical for us in the US. I think it's beetles are uh, the darkling beetle is a bigger risk for us for campy and for salmonella. We've known for years that salmonella can live in the digestive tract of a beetle. And they burrow into the litter and, and into the feces, broilers, and this is actually a turkey gizzard. They want to eat beetles. And so what's inside that beetle ends up inside the turkey or inside the broiler, whether it's salmonella or campy. So I, after the last WHO expert panel that I uh, served on, we came up with a list of recommendations for on-farm interventions. And when I came back, I had the opportunity through a USDA grant to actually try this. And Elizabeth Dale uh, was uh, a graduate student at the time, and this was her project. We wanted to try everything that this WHO expert panel um, had recommended. So we found a cooperating broiler company. It was, and we wanted a smaller farm so that it was easier to manage. So it was a two house farm. And we followed three broiler flocks on this two house farm. The first flock was our baseline. We took all of our samples that we were going to take at the end of our test flocks on that first flock. Then we instituted all of those steps. We put step over barrier so that you didn't just walk into the, into the broiler house. You had to sit down on a bench, take your shoes off, swing your feet around, put on boots for just inside that, that house disinfectant boot dips, alcohol gel for hands, separate buckets for the mortality in any equipment. Well, each house had its own that didn't leave. The cleaning and disinfecting was as if it was a primary breeder's grandparent house. We cleaned, we disinfected. Um, it was as clean a broiler house as I've ever seen. And then we formaldehyde fumigated. The litter that we used was, was heat treated and baled and brought to the farm. And then the bales opened inside the house. Maxie Nolan helped us with the beetle control and the rodent control, way beyond anything that anyone would do in the US normally. We put fly traps around the outside of the house. We put beetle traps on the inside rodent traps inside and out. And we fogged the entrance routinely for flies, the, the ante room. And if you want to look up all the details, Elizabeth published this, this research in, in the Journal of Applied Poultry Research. So how did it turn out? I'm only going to show you the results of the third flock. The second flock went positive for campy somewhere around two weeks, just as if we had done nothing, both houses. We were pretty disappointed. So we redoubled our efforts. We went back through and did all these things over again. 
including the cleaning, disinfecting, formaldehyde fumigation, everything, all over again. What did we do? We delayed when the flocks went positive for Campy. Rather than two weeks now, house one went positive at three weeks, and house two didn't go positive until four weeks. But when they did go positive, they went very strongly positive. And these were uh, boot sock samples that were the environmental samples. So all of this cleaning and disinfecting and step over barriers and everything you could think of to do didn't make Campy go away. Just delayed when they went positive. But when they went positive, they went very strongly positive. So we're pretty disappointed. So why did this happen? You recall I said we put beetle traps. So what we wanted to understand was where was that campy coming from? How did it get in that house? Why, why did we delay it? If we look at that third flock, the adult beetles didn't show up until week three in house one. And, it, and if you remember, house one was went positive in week three. House two, we had very few beetles until week five. And if you recall, house two was the one that went positive later. So I think what happens is that these beetles are still carrying the campy. And if we can't completely eliminate them, they're going to re-show up. And you can look at the number. So by the time the flock was depopulated, we had over 1,100 in, in house one uh, in the 10 traps that we put throughout the house that they are probably for us in the U.S., one of our major... Achilles heel for Campy being maintained in a broiler farm and then transferred to the broilers. And uh, Elizabeth got very good at culturing beetles for Campy. I don't think I would ask her to, to culture any bugs any longer. She got pretty tired of culturing bugs for Campy. But these, these beetles were positive for Campy. And the interesting thing was we did trap a lot of flies. You know, it's a broiler farm. It's a farm. You're going to see flies outside. We didn't see flies on the inside, but, but we, we did trap flies on the outside of the farm, and we never isolated any campy from those flies. I can't not talk about other pests. I don't know that rodents are a source for maintaining campy on our broiler farms but i'm sure they're they can be a mechanical vector of carrying it into or carrying it around the broiler farm they may be a, le a less risk for us for campy than they are for salmonella anyway we, we look at it both salmonella and campy we want to minimize our rodent pests so by doing all of these things, we can delay Campy, but we're not making it go away. And the reason that I, I give you this example of, and this is what we did on that farm, is that the insecticide is last because we want that, that residual insecticide to be effective throughout the flock and not wash it off with our disinfectant. Litter can be a source. We don't know why. Uh, and I've cultured, you take a broiler flock out, cultured the litter immediately, and it's positive for campy. Go back in in two weeks when you repopulate, and you're not going to find it. You'll find salmonella, but not campy. Where it goes and why it hides away, we don't know. But we do know that Campy, like salmonella, does not like an acidic environment. The lower the pH, 
the more kill we'll have with with Campy as we'd get with uh, Salmonella. The other is water lines and Margie Lee, when she was uh, here at Georgia, did a lot of work looking at Campy and water lines and you can find Campy within the biofilm of, of a nipple drinker water line. So it will survive quite happily in that biofilm. So water line disinfection has to be part of our Campy control program. This is the listing of, if you ever want to look up a WHO expert panel's recommendations, I, I looked two weeks ago before I taught class, and it's still on WHO's uh, website. But this is the listing of what that panel suggested for on-farm on controls for Campy. Biosecurity, minimize vegetation, Insect control, and for the Europeans, it's fly screens. For us, it's darkling beetle. Depopulation, so thinning is when a catch crew comes in to remove the, the hens and lets the roosters have the remaining part of the house. And that, that thinning is a risk for biosecurity because you're bringing a crew of people into your broiler house. Drinking water disinfection. Interventions, we, we really don't have good interventions. We've tested a lot in my, my current position. We've had some success with vaccination. I think we'll, we'll see some, some interventions as Campy becomes more of a, a control issue on the farm. But as yet, we don't have anything that I can put my hand on my heart and say, this is what I would suggest you use. So before I quit, I'd like to give you some things to think about. So maybe some, some things that if you're in a research position, you can, you can try to give us a greater depth of knowledge. Nelson Cox found that the dose of the challenge doesn't affect the numbers at the end. So I can challenge with Campy at 10 to the 2 or 10 to the six in a challenge model. And I'm still going to get a very high load at the end uh, from the seek of those broilers. And he found that cloacal swabs are a pretty easy way to find campy in broiler. Jenny Baxter, our lab manager has done a lot of work with campy. And in fact, that some of that USDA research I showed you was, was part of her masters. That the day of challenge, for Campy doesn't seem to affect the number either. So I can challenge them on day three or day seven or day 21, and I'm still going to have a high number of, of Campy in the Sika. There is a big difference though with challenge strains. So as you review data in literature, look at are they uh, laboratory adapted strains versus strains that are very typical of the uh, normal broiler types of strains because some of the laboratory adapted strains were colonized to, we've seen as high as 10 to the 12, very high. Vertical transmission is very controversial. Nelson Cox could find it in chick papers in broiler hatcheries, in the semen of roosters. And if you orally or intracloically inoculate campy into a day old chick, they'll become positive very quickly. So why we don't find campy until 14 days, uh, as a rule on broiler farms, we don't understand. It's probably vertical transmission probably doesn't occur, or if it does, it occurs at a very, very low level. So campy is a normal flora. The broilers live just fine with campy jejuni in their intestines and it doesn't affect them performance wise, body weight, feed efficiency, growth rate. Uh, on this uh, last week when I, I spoke at that meeting at, um, with FSIS and NCC and NTF, um, we had uh, other 
uh, speakers and Marco Sanchez from Texas Tech said he was talking about salmonella, but in the end he said, you know, I know you're thinking campy as well. And for me, for him in the processing plant, he's, his comment was the campy load is so high that what we do as interventions probably don't drop it down enough for us to be effective, which is exactly what we saw. And in what we saw with the farm, that the load is high at the farm coming into the plant and that the interventions in the plant do bring it down, but the numbers are so high it can't bring it down as much as we see with salmonella. So I think for us in the future, our success is going to be what things can we do on the farm to minimize our, our load of campy coming into the plant so that those interventions that may be working, we just can't tell because the loads are so high, can begin to work so that we can decrease campy. That's going to contaminate carcasses and be a risk for food, human foodborne illness. And with that, I'll end my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions, Andy. All right. Thank you, Professor. And uh, as I noted at the top of the program, folks, you can submit your questions for Dr. Hoffaker using that Q&A widget there at the bottom of your screen. Just click on the Q&A tab. We've also uh, already gotten several in, but would like to uh, have your question as well. We have plenty of time for those. We've got a couple of these. I'm going to start with one that's maybe a little more straightforward and then get into some of the more complex one. Chuck, let's start with this one. Do campy levels increase in birds with age? I, I think I know the answer here, but as you as you look at the age of the animals, do we see the levels increase the older they get? So one of the things that I, the opportunity I have in my current position is that I can challenge broilers at a particular age and then actually track the campy colonization as they get older. And what I've seen is that as broilers, when they first become positive, they, be, they shed at a very high level. And then over time, that shedding begins to decline. And I think this actually have we see this in, in the broiler industry. People that process small birds, say a 38-day broiler, have more campy positive rates than someone processing broilers at say 60 days. And I think it's because they whatever triggers them to become positive or to the rate that we can detect it at 14 days, they're right at that peak at, at small bird programs. And then the numbers naturally begin to decline as they get older so that big bird programs are probably having less campy coming into the plant. That's my conjecture. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting concept. And, and I don't know um, if you have had a chance to study this or not, but do you know, is there a difference between chickens and turkeys in the level of jejuni versus the coli? Yes. Um, what we primarily isolate from turkeys in the processing plant is campy coli, uh, not campy jejuni. The interesting thing is, and, I, and I've and i never tracked it this way, this would be a nice research project for someone, is I think those turkeys are probably more highly positive for campy jejuni when they're younger. And as they get older, then it transitions to campy coli. Because in broiler breeders, we'll see mostly campy coli with some campy jejuni. So it's almost as if the, they switch from jejuni and very young to campy coli and older. And because we process turkeys at 12 to 20 weeks of age, it's probably campy coli by that time. Mm -hmm. This one, uh, a little more, little more complex question. So I'm going to work through it here, make sure I understand it correctly. What kind of difference do we see in terms of the lack of egg or vertical transmission with Campy uh, that would make in any presumably future vaccination program for Campy? 
and, and, and the example they give here is say versus ones that are currently used against salmonella, would it translate into no need for killed vaccines? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, that, that vertical transmission question relative to a vaccination program? So, um, that, that vertical transmission, I don't know that that's actually, uh, I'm not, I'll, I can back up. So I'm not certain that we need to worry about Campy on, in the breeders themselves. And I, I'll give you some data from another student, Peter O'Kane, when he was a student of mine, we looked at a breeder flock that was Campy jejuni and campy coli positive we took broilers or eggs from that flock hatched them at the university and put those broilers in a highly cleaned and disinfected area and they never went positive for campy even though the breeders were highly positive so i don't know that it's there's much there with the egg transmission when it comes to vaccination though whether we've done one study with um inactivated uh, campy vaccine, and it was autogenous. So it was this inactivated made from the same challenge strain and with a special adjuvants that could be used with broilers. And it, it worked well, not 100%, but it worked well in reducing the campy. So is there differences between different Campy so that immunity to one campy might not help against the other, like we see with salmonella. We don't know. Uh, it it's pretty complex, and our knowledge of campy is, is so limited. Uh, I I can't answer that much more than that. We got a couple questions here that did touch on salmonella, and so I'll we'll kind of toss them out together here. Uh, the one does the chicken immunity behave similarly with both salmonella and campy uh and do you think this could be related to the question as to why campy isn't detectable until day 14 i don't know how to i don't know an answer for the immunity part what i can say is that salmonella will attach um to the intestinal epithelial cells it'll attach and invade Whereas campy tends to live um, within the mucosal layer of the intestinal epithelium. And so it's not, it's kind of hanging out, but not attaching in the same way that salmonella does. And so the immune response probably has to be different for campy than it is for salmonella, but I don't know that, that answer for sure. I had a question also about the effect of chilling temperature on salmonella and chicken. And I, and I guess I would just add, you know, what does that tell us? Is there anything there related to campy that we, that we need to know uh, in the context of, of kind of the broader topic of your presentation? Well, we know that campy is um, a more fragile organism than salmonella. And that freezing temperatures uh, will kill campy. So frozen chicken, where it's completely frozen um, under USDA definition of frozen, uh, you won't re-isolate campy, whereas you can with salmonella. So campy doesn't survive freezing. But so far as the chilling temperatures that we use to chill the carcasses, that's not cold enough to to affect the campy and eliminate it. I think campy probably does the same thing as salmonella that it gets into those feather follicles and once once we've gone through the scalder and the processing plant if it if it's gotten into those feather follicles it's kind of a protected area and I think that's where um some of the interventions like PAA and some of the other things that we use help us to minimize the amount that can survive to get into those follicles. 
Question here, uh, looking at the, you mentioned the increase of prevalence from farm to plant. Does the campy load increase during the live haul as well? Yeah, that I think one of the things that we see, and this salmonella does the same thing, is that if, let's say you're, you're in live haul in the U.S. where we're not covered um, and it rains, we see that on rainy days, we'll have higher levels of salmonella. And I think it's because that moisture gives the salmonella the chance to, to stay alive. And it also um, pushes it more down onto the birds. And we see the same thing with uh, Campy. I think contamination of the live haul equipment and that stress of the transport and any moisture in the summertime, if we have have uh, fans with fogging nozzles, we're adding moisture. All of that live haul part of it is probably going to increase both salmonella and campy. Here's a question about you know, the specific point at which we translate um, the, the load to illness in humans. Do we know yet? Have we been able to pin down the load, the log, or the abundance for sequencing in broilers that translates to illness in humans? You know, I don't know. Um, if they know what the infectious dose is for humans with Campy, I know they did this with Salmonella back in a long time ago. They were, they did some infectious dose studies for different salmonella serovars, but with campy, I don't know what the infectious dose would be for someone to eat and, and get sick. A couple of questions here on intervention. So you mentioned there's no such thing, uh, no such pre-harvest or post-harvest additives that can control campy at this point, but do you know of any candidates that would potentially reduce to a nominal level? Are there, is there anything on your on your radar, so to speak? Well, some of the, the interventions that we can use on the farm, I think we've looked at it in the wrong way. We've looked at it as, did we eliminate Campy? Did we make it go away? And what we need to look at is, um, and that's why I say that I, I don't know that today I can put my hand on my heart and say this product will make it go away or lower it significantly. I think we're probably going to have to look at multiple interventions to get those numbers down. So a, a lot of the interventions that we use that help us for salmonella may also help us with campy. We just don't know um, because we have, we've looked at more, did we make the prevalence decrease rather than did we knock it down by a log or not two logs? And along those same lines, any research done yet on bacteriophages versus campy yet? Yeah, there's been um, both that that area of research is really gaining gaining steam for both uh, campy and salmonella and clostridium. You know, these bacterial viruses uh, are very efficient. Um, they're called they're lytic viruses. They're efficient at killing their target bacteria. One of the, the negatives is that if the virus is very efficient and it kills off all the sensitive strains, what's left are those that can survive with those viruses. And so a lot of what we're looking at is cocktails of multiple viruses that so that if they become resistant to one, you know, we've got a cocktail with another one or two in there. So I think in the future, we'll be seeing more about bacteriophage um, as an intervention for it. And you've alluded to this a little bit, but I'll, I'll bring up the question anyway. What experience have you had testing or have you had a chance to test a combined approach like you've, you've kind of alluded to a few times uh, to control colonization. In other words, something like, let's say, organic acids in water and oligosaccharides in the feed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that That more kind of combined intervention approach? I've done a lot more work with salmonella with those combined interventions because we've, that's 
on the greater front burner for us because of FSIS regulations and I've not tested combined interventions for Campy, uh, but I don't see why they shouldn't work, why a combination of products shouldn't be just as effective. It may not be the same ones effective for Salmonella as for Campy, but I think it's going to take a multiple approach. Uh, our, our good friend Greg asks, uh, in your, your time uh, period measurements of on-farm and then the change in the Campy numbers, was there any measurable relationship to birds measured performance? And he can put that into air quotes for us. If so, was it economically important? And, and if not, do we need to focus simply on processing treatment means? Well, we didn't, we didn't track a flock's particular performance um, in when they went positive for campy or their campy load. So I can't answer that part of it. What I can say is that through the published literature, we don't see that Campy has a negative impact on broiler performance, at least the Campy strains that, that we currently have in the U.S. So I think it's more of a human foodborne illness that we need to reduce the Campy coming from the broiler farm into the plant so that the plant can then be successful in lowering the, the Campy going to humans. We're getting down to our last couple questions here. Although, friends, we do still have uh, about eight minutes. If you want to submit a, a question, you do that on that Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Professor, what's the impact of feed withdrawal on campy levels in the birds? That I don't know. I've not measured or not been a part of any studies that, that measured feed withdrawal and, and campy levels. So sorry, I can't answer that one. Is that another one of those where you want to put out the call to uh, people who are, are listening? Hey, here's a good here's a good research yep. opportunity for you. Yeah, I'm an enterprising grad student. Get on that. Uh, another question here: Why do you think Campy and Salmonella levels were so high in the bootstocks compared to the other methods you talked about? Well, I think it has to do with um, how well that sample can be taken that's representative of what's being what's in that whole house so a boot sock um let me back up so nelson cox did some work looking at drag swabs early on and those drag swabs are just that gauze that's being drug over top of the surface what he found was if he stepped on those drag swabs as he went through the house he got better um isolation of salmonella and i think it's because of pressure we're able to to rather than just skimming across the surface or picking a sample off the surface of a litter sample that by that boot sock we're actually stepping in in, in multiple areas within the whole house all right and we have gotten through literally all the questions that were submitted so i, I think uh we'll i'll leave you with one uh question i have you mentioned you know a couple of times and i joked about it a second ago uh, opportunities for future research so what are things on your radar research you'd like to conduct or would like to see others conduct based on kind of the foundation you've given us here where where do we go next i guess to summarize the question yeah i think the the biggest unsolved question is why don't we pick up campy in a broiler flock until they're two weeks old um and i use two weeks just as a round number we don't you know seven days to two weeks why is that where does it go where is it hiding and what what causes it to hide and then all of a sudden show up and you know, that may help us to understand better our controls if we understand its life cycle a little better. And I think interventions where we'll see over the next few years, a lot of research on multiple different interventions that may work for both Campy and Salmonella. Um, and I think it's primarily because Salmonella is a greater risk right now based on the FSIS regulatory climate 
than campy. We see more research on salmonella, but I would like to strongly encourage other people to research, do, the, do some research and help us with campy before it becomes a major issue so that we have interventions already worked out. Well said, Professor, and I think that's a good place to leave it. Friends, I want to thank Dr. Chuck Hoffaker, member of the Board of Directors of the Poultry Science Association, and uh, a, a wealth of information on Campy and many other many other uh, related topics. So, Chuck, thank you for being a part of our first webinar of 2023. Friends, we are going to host these webinars quarterly as, as we've been doing, so we'll look forward to having uh, another great talk later on in the spring over the course of the summer and on into the fall. Stay tuned to our website, uh, the Poultry Science Association website. Of course, is our e-newsletter and social media channels as well for updates on future webinar topics. If there's a topic you'd like to see us cover, reach out to us via social or drop us an email and we'll put that in the works as well. would also encourage you to visit our YouTube channel uh, for our Let's Squawk About It series where we have a series of interviews with experts like Chuck. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and do that. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that registration is now open for the Poultry Science Association's annual meeting. The industry's preeminent scientific program. Uh, we are excited to host you in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania this July. Early bird registration, your best deal, is now available through the end of April. Housing blocks are open, so do please go to the website, uh, the Poultry Science Association uh, website, and you can register there and get all the information about the annual meeting, the scientific program, more than a dozen symposia, as well as, of course, all of the abstract and poster presentations as well. So get involved. Find all the information on our website, and we'll look forward to seeing you in Philadelphia. On behalf of Dr. Hoffaker, the staff and board of directors here at PSA, I'm Andy Vance, wishing you a profitable rest of your day.